Okay, uh, first off, I'd like to start out by uh, following in Greg's footsteps from last time by saying that the topic I'm about to present on, the people who are referred to as situationists, would assert that uh, situationism does not exist, and that's a nonsense word coined by anti-situationists. Anyways, uh, the Situationist International uh, existed from 1957 through 1972. It was international, but it was um, primarily French-based. Basically, the uh, precedents uh, for Situationism are art movements such as Dada and Surrealism. <clears throat> um, Dada, for those who aren't familiar with it, was an art movement that arose um, in the wake of World War I. Basically, people were upset with the bourgeois culture that had produced such a mass slaughter such as World War I. So they tried to reject all of the bourgeois values, including art. So they, were they would consider themselves an anti-art movement. And so they tried to uh, basically just create images and ideas and things like that that would uh, shock people and were anti-aesthetic, that didn't have any aesthetic precedent to them. Um, the Situationist International was formed out of uh, several different organizations, which all merged in 1957. One of them was the International Movement for an Imaginist Bauhaus. Uh, basically, they um, were an architecture and design type group uh, that were anti-functionalist, whereas usually the, the, the original Bauhaus kind of manifesto was form follows function. The Imaginist Bauhaus would have, called, would have said form follows fun. Uh, another um, organization was the Letterist International. Basically, they existed from 1952 to 57. They were basically like the French beatniks or something like that. Uh, there was also the London Psychogeographical Association. Now, psychogeography is, uh, as Guy Debord put it, uh, the study of precise laws and specific effects of the ge geographical environment, consciously organized or not, on the emotions of behavior in individuals. So basically just uh, the idea of the effect that the environment has on the, on the psychology of the person. <clears throat> uh, so Situationist, Situationist International had both kind of uh, an artistic wing and a political wing. The artistic wing was uh, represented by people like uh, Asger Jorn and uh, initially Guy Debord. And um, the political was uh, Raoul uh, Benign and later Debord become more of a political uh, type person. Um, <clears throat> basically, the artistic wing of the Situationist International sought to integrate art and politics uh, and art in everyday life. They rejected art as, the spe as a specialized practice of you know, trained artists. Um, one of their key concepts was unitary urbanism, which was uh, first promoted by the, the Letterist uh, organization. And that was the idea that uh, art and your environment should be integrated. They rejected functionalism. Um, see, as Gil J. Woolman said, uh, a unitary urbanism is the synthesis of art and technology that we call for. It must be constructed according to certain new values of life, values which now need to be distinguished and disseminated. Uh, hypergraphy which, uh, was one of the ideas that kind of led to this, which, is, which was the merging of writing with other media as opposed to just reading a book. There would be you know, images and other things that were, that they brought into that. Um, some of the art that, uh, that in individuals in the Situationist uh, did were, um, Asger Yorn did what he called modifications, which basically he um, appropriated paintings uh, by unknown artists and then he would paint over them in kind of a, uh, kind of a modern expressionist way, kind of just to say that we can appropriate um, aspects of, of bourgeois society and turn them into something else to kind of, I don't know, shock people or something like that. Uh, Giuseppe Pino Galizio, he did um, what he called industrial paintings. Basically, it was a parody of mass production where he would get giant rolls of canvas and he would just kind of paint just random, random patterns on them and he would, um, <clears throat> he would come off a roll and he would sell them by the meter. He wanted to trade entire cities in industrial paintings. Um, Guy Debord made uh, six films, um, which he took off the market for about 20 years. Uh, one of his films was, uh, was just uh, basically found footage. And every time there was dialogue happening, it would show white people. And then when silence was occurring, he would show black people. In, uh, 
And our project that Deborah and Yorn did together was called um, Memoirs. It was a book. Yeah, the intro to it was by, written by Marx. It, go, it's, it was just a quote from him. It says, let the dead bury the dead and mourn them. Our fate will to become the first living people to enter the new life. Uh, the book was bound in sandpaper, so when they would file it on a bookshelf, it would destroy the books around it. Um, it incorporates, uh, basically it was, there was, it was built in two layers, so um, the first layer would have been print and things like that uh, appropriated from, from society at the time, maps, newspapers, things like that. And then uh, over the top of those, to kind of interrupt uh, the, per the person who's reading it, the, their flow of thought were uh, kind of splashes of colored ink and things like that. Now, um, the, uh, the newspaper clippings, the maps, the advertisements and things they used in that, that was uh, an idea that uh, was called, that the situation is called the spectacle. Now, Guy Debord kind of came up with a spectacle and he wrote about it in his book, Society of the Spectacle. Uh, and here's a quote for him, from him on that, this, which is, the spectacle epitomizes the prevailing model of social life. It is, it is the omnipresent celebration of a choice already made in the sphere of production, and the consummate result of that choice. In form as in content, the spectacle serve, serves a, as total justification for the conditions and aims of the existing system. Now, in developing uh, his theory of the spectacle, Debord kind of drew on um, two ideas from, from Karl Marx, first of which is commodity fetishism, and the second is reification. Uh, commodity fetishism is basically the idea that social relations have been transformed by capitalism into relationships between objects. So the producers are unaware of who, are, who, for who is going to consume their, their product, so they're alienated from them in that sense. Consumers are unaware of who produced the product, so their relationship with one another is through the, commo is through the commodity itself. Now, reification is basically the idea of attributing concreteness to, human, to abstract human constructions. An example of this would be like the idea of God, who is a projection of uh, human imagination, which begins to then uh, have autonomy and rule over human behavior. Um, and a quote from Karl Marx, which I think kind of encompasses this idea, is a commodity is therefore a mysterious thing, simply because in it the social character of men's labor appears to them as an objective character stamped upon the product of that labor. Because the relationship of the producers to the sum total of their own labor is presented to them as a social relation, existing not between themselves, but between the products of their labor. There is a definite social relation between men that assumes in their eyes the fantastic form of, re of a relation between things. In order, therefore, to find an analogy, we must, we must have recourse to the mist-enveloped regions of the religious world. In that world, the productions of the human brain appear as independent beings endowed with life and entering into relations both one with another and the human race. So it is in the world of commodities with the products of men's hands. This I call fetishism, which attaches itself to the products of labor so soon as they are produced as commodities, and which is therefore inseparable from the production of comedies, commodities. So Debord's idea of the spectacle is basically a commodity, commodity, <laughs> commodity fetishism and reification as they are manifested in advanced capitalism and in modern society in general particularly through the means of mass media. Um, for instance, television. When we watch television, uh, well, children for today are kind of raised on television. They gain a lot of their understanding of what the real world is through television. So in that way, it mediates between us and the real world. And in that way, also, media becomes, uh, becomes its own version of reality. 